All right. So the technology is working. We got this thing to work. I was kind of worried there. Um, okay. So uh, as promised, uh, somebody asked last week about Thomas Jefferson's uh, brothers and sisters, and I had not uh, looked into that. So I did, and um, so uh, his father, Peter Jefferson, and wife, Jane, had 10 children together. And they had a pretty good uh, uh, life. They had a pretty good uh, number of them survived till adulthood. Only two of them died in childbirth, which is a pretty good rate, I suppose, back in those days. Um, and so of the eight, uh, Thomas Jefferson was the third of them, and he had one younger brother survived. The two that died in childbirth were both boys. The rest were girls. Um, and the last uh, were twins. So that um, the brother, uh, the younger brother that he had was a fraternal twin. Um, one other thing I was gonna mention about Thomas Jefferson um, that was kind of interesting, I had mentioned that uh, Fawn Brody in her biography uh, used a lot of Freudian uh, techniques to, to get into the inner workings of Jefferson. And she had a real field day with his mother and women in general. His, his mother uh, was uh, apparently not a very kind and loving sort to her children. Um, and so, and this supposedly uh, wore on Jefferson in his uh, in his adult life, and he wrote a number of things just casually uh, in letters about women in general that uh, weren't always uh, PC, as we would say today. Um, and one of the uh, one of the most telling was uh, when he was writing about the French Revolution, and he said that Marie Antoinette was really the cause of the French Revolution. <laughs> That, uh, <laughs> that King Louis, if he was a, he had more of a backbone and could stand up to her, then none of this would have happened. It was all her fault. So, so now we're on Thomas Paine. And um, what I found interesting, first off, just uh, in researching about Thomas Paine, the books that you will find on Thomas Paine um, nowadays are almost always written by someone who has a political uh, slant to it. Uh, someone, it, it's, it's, you'll be hard pressed to find a biography of Thomas Paine that's just about Thomas Paine. Uh, they will usually use him uh, to promote a particular political angle. Uh, and that's what I found is in what I have read on him. So here's the bibliography. The first one, John Dos Passos. How many of you are familiar with the novels of John Dos Passos? Uh, a contemporary of uh, uh, Hemingway. Uh, the two of them were friends and then uh, later were not so much. Uh, John Dos Passos in the 20s and 30s uh, was one of the big names. Uh, in uh, the literary world at the time. Uh, and he came out with this book, uh, The Living Thoughts of Tom Paine. Only about 50 pages of this is the biography. The rest of it are the writings, some of the writings of Tom Paine. Um, and it, it, interesting, he has his own particular slant, as most do, uh, in this uh, book. And then, of course, uh, you'll need to have Thomas Paine's writings uh, themselves. He, uh, he's a man of letters. He was not a man of action, as most of the others that I'm covering here. Uh, he didn't have a life filled with a lot of uh, action other than his writings. Now, he did do some pretty interesting things and lived through some uh, pretty amazing events, but his role was a writer, first and foremost. Uh, Eric Foner, the Tom Paine in Revolutionary America, 
um, and Harvey J. K., Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. As I say, uh, these authors have their own uh, bent, their own opinions about uh, what they're trying to promote. They're not, this is, these are not just biographies talking about the life of Thomas Paine and his writings. It's also about America and the philo uh, philosophical uh, writings, ideas, and how they apply today. So we don't have a lot of information about his uh, early life. I mean, we know the basics of what happened, where he was from, and all that, um, but we don't have a lot of details of his early life before he came to America. Uh, it's, it's kind of just sketchy because um, there weren't, he didn't save his letters, or very many of them, um, and we don't have a lot uh, from him. Uh, like many of these characters, uh, he either uh, tore them up himself or others did it for him, a lot of the papers that he had uh, about his early life. Okay, so he was born January 29th, 1737 to Joseph and Francis. His parents were Quakers. I had to, I have to adjust this. His, his father was a Quaker. His mother was actually an Anglican, or came from the Anglican background. Uh, but once they are married, they were Quakers. His father was a stay maker. Now, in most biographies, um, they go over this fairly quickly. A stay maker, as some of you may know, is a corset. And so he, they made, supposedly, women's corsets. Uh, and that's what he did for a living. Um, I came across one author who said that that may not be true, but only one of the authors I, did, I read suggested this. A stay is also a type of rope that is used on ships. So he thinks that um, the whole stay maker thing was uh, something that people would come up with in order to make fun of him. He made ladies' corsets. Ha. Huh? Isn't that funny? Um, so, uh, but, like I said, it was only one of the authors that I came across. Everybody else just assumed that he was a stay maker making ladies' corsets. Uh, so he went to school age 7 to 13. He apprenticed with his father making stays. And so I put both of them up here just to cover both bases. Um, so here is a stay on a ship. And here is a stay on a lady. <laughs> so, um, as a young man, uh, age 16, like many young men in England, uh, the sea has this romantic uh, air about it, and uh, the adventure and challenge of being, up at, being out at sea um, thrills a lot of young men. And so he uh, joined, he enlisted as a uh, member, as a privateer, and did that for about a year, and decided it wasn't as romantic as they make it out to be. Came back home. Uh, by this time, he was a master stay maker, so he set himself up, or his, his father actually helped him uh, get started in his own stay making business. Uh, he married L Mary Lambert, 1759. She died in childbirth a year later along with the child. Um, he became an excise officer, collecting duties in England at the age of 25. He was fired from that job not too much later uh, because like many excise officers, they're under great pressure to cheat, to take bribes, and to put stamps on cargoes that they have not inspected. And uh, supposedly that's what he did, and so he was fired. Um, he got rehired later on because he protested, and I guess the evidence wasn't uh, strong enough. But anyway, so he became a staymaker again in uh, Lewes, Sussex, and that's where he got hooked up with others who were uh, who liked debating scientific and political type stuff. And um, I like to say too, science back in these days uh, were totally dominated 
by one character. What did everybody talk about? Who is the main guy in the 1700s? If you were into science at all, you talked about who? <laughs> Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. He died in 1715, but he dominated the scientific world ever since. And if you were in England and you were into any kind of science, you talked about Isaac Newton. And one of the other things, even if you weren't into science as we know it today, but you were into other fields, Newton was there too. If you talked about politics, Newton, what he did for science was to organize everything, make it make sense. The natural world, the planets, the stars, they all make sense now because of Isaac Newton. Why can't we do that with politics? A lot of people were thinking, if, the, if nature can be organized and structured, why can't we? So let's come up with a scientific uh, type of government where everything is structured in the right way. If we can do that, then we'll have utopia on Earth. And that's what some people, the uh, avant-garde thinkers of the day, uh, were thinking about. And this is what uh, Thomas Paine and his group uh, were going over. He was also into science as we know it too, uh, and engineering as we'll see. Uh, and this of course is where he met Ben Franklin who was in England at the time in the, in the 1760s and uh, became friends because Ben Franklin loved these types of discussions. Uh, and during the 1760s, um, this is where we don't know a lot about what exactly he was doing. Uh, there are rumors that he was a Methodist preacher uh, for a time. Um, uh, he was a vestryman, he, he was a teacher in smallish sort of schools, uh, but a lot of things we don't know. He was married again, uh, Elizabeth Olive, in 1771. This uh, was probably a marriage of convenience and not of love. This is, again, historians believe this is probably the case. We don't know for sure. Um, she was the daughter of his landlord. He was living at a particular place, and the landlord was a, uh, had a business in tobacco, making tobacco snuff. And um, so he got to know Elizabeth, they got married, and he started helping out with the business. Uh, the father died, and he took over the business, and they were married. And I, 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 again, a lot of historians will tell you it was most likely a marriage of convenience and not of love. Uh, and many believe that they did not uh, sleep together. It was never consummated. She never had children, that's for sure. Um, he got an excise job back, but again, he lost it again. Uh, this time, he was absent without leave, and he was fired. Probably it had to do with, uh, he was protesting their pay. They were very poorly paid, not very well treated, and, um, and so he led the group of young men who were uh, protesting this. He wrote up uh, a petition and delivered it, and he was fired later on. At this point, um, he separates from his wife, and um, he's got not much. He still has his skills as a stay maker, but he probably wasn't really uh, enthralled with that position either. So he talked with Ben Franklin, and Ben Franklin said, why don't you move to America? I will give you a letter of introduction to my son-in-law, and he will make you, he'll give you connections in Philadelphia. Uh, he seems to be a pretty intelligent, bright sort of guy, and um, so he took him up on it. The one thing that he did get from his divorce or separation from his wife uh, was 35 pounds uh, because he, Technically, he owned the business as her husband, and so in their separation, he got some money out of it, and so he had money to come to America. So he arrives in Philadelphia on November 30th, 1774. The trip was horrible. There is typhus, a typhus outbreak on the ship, 
as they came over, five people died. He was sick. He had to be carried off the ship. And he was laid up for the next six weeks with typhus. Um, but at the end of that time, uh, he had his connection with uh, Richard Bache, uh, Franklin's son-in-law. And being a, a pretty sharp guy, it was recognized right away that he could do, uh, he could teach or he could write, uh, he could do a number of things. Uh, he met uh, Robert Aiken, who was a publisher, published a magazine, and um, he thought Thomas Paine might be a good addition to his business. So the impressions, when Thomas Paine arrived in America and he started getting to know people and what Philadelphia was like, he was amazed. It is so different from England. And here's his quote, I am tempted to believe that even the air of the Atlantic disagrees with the constitution of foreign vices. So on the trip over, people <laughs> magically lose the vices of Europe in this new world. He's, he could see people were relatively equal among uh, the populace, the prosperity was notable, and uh, people were very industrious, hardworking. Uh, and he noticed there were a lot fewer homeless beggars out on the streets than you would see in London. So the Pennsylvania Magazine, he, start, he got involved with, and he was writing articles for this, and he was an editor, and he was way ahead of his time in the articles that he was writing against slavery. This is a very new idea for a lot of people. He was against dueling, uh, the subjugation of women. Almost nobody wrote about uh, how women were treated in those days, and he started writing about that. Cruelty to animals, another thing nobody really thought much about. Uh, he was in favor of more liberal divorce laws, being a divorced man himself, and he could criticize the British government. Uh, as you know, this is 1775 now, just before Lexington and Concord, there's a lot of talk about the British rule and the uh, rights of Englishmen. And right away, very quickly, the subscriptions increased from 600 to 1500. He was a very popular writer. And then Lexington and Concord happened. It was a great shock to everyone, both in, in Britain and in America, the British, of course, the reactions are quite different. In Great Britain, they're demanding submission. How dare those colonists fire on the king's troops? It was an outrage. In America, quite different. Uh, how dare those British attack us? And, but it was still about reconciliation. Almost nobody was talking about independence. They did not want a separation. They wanted reconciliation. And this was something that uh, Thomas Paine noticed and was somewhat frustrated by. He couldn't understand it. Why is it that you are attacked by the British and yet uh, you still want reconciliation? And here's his quote. Their attachment to Britain was obstinate and was a kind of treason to speak against it. They disliked the ministry, but they esteemed the nation. Very few people, uh, despite the bloodshed, uh, was willing to say much about the king. It's one thing that was taboo. You did not criticize the king. You can criticize parliament. You can criticize the king's ministers, but you did not criticize the king. And even after Lexington and Concord, a number of, here's a couple of quotes from very prominent uh, patriots. George Washington, if you ever hear of my joining in such measures, set me down for everything wicked. And this was just a couple of months after Lexington and Concord. Thomas Jefferson, there is not a man who more cordially loves a union with Britain. It is neither our wish nor our interest to separate. This was in November 
of uh, 1775. And then King George made a speech delivered to Parliament in October of 75. It reached America in January of 76, in which he denounces this open, horrible revolt. Now openly avow their revolt, hostility, and rebellion, condemning the Americans for this outrage that they would fire on the king's troops, that they are setting up, uh, that they are gathering their troops, they're training their troops, gathering supplies. This is open rebellion. And this, long before, there was open rebellion. He considered it so. And so when it came, when the message finally got to America in January, uh, many people were getting pretty angry at the king. He didn't seem to understand that people in America really did want reconciliation. There's King George. <laughs> also in January of 1776, was common sense. Thomas Paine was asked by a friend of his to uh, write something about uh, the need to separate from Great Britain. Very few people were talking about it, and this was usually uh, the, uh, the more intellectual types who would bring it up, but couldn't speak openly about it. And so, he was asked by uh, Benjamin Rush to write this pamphlet. And Benjamin Rush told him, you know, I would like to write something like this, but I dare not. I have family. I have connections. I have a house, a wife and kids. I have friends. I have a position. If I write something like common sense, like this uh, against the king, I could lose everything. You have nothing. You don't, you don't have a family. You don't have money. You don't have a house. You've got nothing. Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. So he said, "It would be better if you would write this. You've got nothing to lose." And so he did. And the the thing about common sense is that. He could write in a style that commoners could understand. And uh, I'll, yeah, let me get to that in a minute. Um, he ridicules the I. He doesn't really attack uh, King George personally that much. What he does is he attacks monarchy in general. He goes beyond. It's not about King George. It's not about this parliament. It's about the whole system. It sold 125,000 copies in just a few months, making it most likely the, the best, biggest bestseller ever in the United States, proportionally speaking. There were only two million or so people in the United or in the colonies at the time, and um, this was a huge, wild uh, bestseller. This was a book that nobody could ignore. Here's what it looks like. How many pages? It's not long. It, it's, you know, I call it a book. It was really more of a pamphlet. Uh, depending on the font size, it could range from 30 to 50 pages. If you buy a book that has common sense, you're not going to uh, buy a book that just has common sense. So you're gonna have that along with some of his other writings, because it's too short to really publish as a book. So this was the book that everyone had to talk about. Even if you didn't want to hear about it, you were going to. If you couldn't read, someone would read it to you, probably whether you liked it or not. Everybody knew about it. Everybody wanted to read it if they hadn't yet because all your friends were reading it. And again, the trick to this book, 
And what was so different about this was that he was not just talking about securing our rights. He was talking about recasting the whole argument. We do not just want um, them to restore our rights. That whole system is corrupt. We need to change it. So he recast the argument from American rights to what is good and what is bad government. And he, in a sense, broke the ice. Something that people did not want to talk about previously, thought was uh, treason to criticize the king. He not only criticized the king, he criticized the whole idea of monarchy. The whole thing, we need to start over, was his idea. So I'm gonna give a, a kind of a rundown on what uh, the arguments were. I personally, I found the, the uh, 40 or 50 pages uh, a bit disorganized uh, for my taste. He was not a well-structured writer. Uh, he has a lot of good one-liners in there. And there's an overall general uh, theme in different parts, uh, but it's not really that well-structured. So about monarchy, the state of a king shuts him off from the world, yet the business of a king requires him to know it thoroughly. Pretty good point. Um, he argues that the Bible argues against kingship. And for those of you who are uh, knowledgeable of the Bible, in 1 Samuel is where the Israelites come to Samuel and say, we want a king. And Samuel says, uh, well, no, that's not what God wants. And so God talks to Samuel and says, it's okay. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me. We'll give them a king. And that'll teach them a good lesson. But um, so he uses that argument. And the people, of course, in the Bible themselves will say, uh, we have sinned in asking for a king, uh, but we're going to get one. And so he uses that to say, see, in the, in the very beginning, God says that kings are bad. Um, and the, the idea of hereditary succession. Uh, he says no one by birth could have a right to set up his own family and in perpetual preference to all others. The idea is ridiculous that someone would do that. And he goes back to uh, William the Conqueror um, and how who would accept William the Conqueror as a God-given king? He invaded and took over against the will of the people. And he had to throw in that he was a bastard on top of that. <laughs> and then, kind of roughly speaking, the next section uh, was talking about independence. And uses some analogies. Shall a child who has thrived on milk be deprived of meat? In other words, are we supposed to be children in perpetuity? Um, parents don't make war on their families. Europe, and this is another point, he was saying that uh, Britain, some people will say, is our mother or our father, our parent. And yet, we have people from all over Europe here in America. Britain is not our father or mother. Uh, Europe is our parent. So Britain, or Europe and not Britain, is the mother of America. And another thing that he uh, focused on is commerce. Because so many people were worried. Well, whatever will we do if we separate from Great Britain? Uh, we'll be doomed. We can't survive. And his comment, I really like this, uh, we will always have a market while eating is the custom in Europe. <laughs> we'll survive just fine. People still want to buy stuff from us, and we will be just fine. And so he has a plan of government that, um, he, of course, the other big question is, if we separate, what kind of government would we have? And so he came up with this plan it's, it's a very loosely described in, the, uh, in common sense, but it comes out something like this. You have annual elections, a unicameral legislature, uh, not bicameral. Unicameral is more democratic. The reason that 
you have a bicameral legislature, especially back in those days, is the lower house is for the commoners. The upper house is for the aristocracy or for the high born. And as for those of you who know our constitution, originally senators were not chosen by popular vote. That was the idea that um, you have the lower house and the upper house. You don't want the upper house chosen by the masses, but we, we liked that idea and we put that in. Okay, so each colony was to send 30 delegates to Congress. One colony would be chosen by lot to uh, pick the president for that term and then they would take turns, each colony would uh, choose from among their delegates the president for that particular year. And you must have three-fifths uh, vote to pass legislation. And then the next section, can we win in a war against Great Britain? Another big question that many people thought, well, it'd be impossible. That's the greatest uh, military on earth, or at least in Europe. And who are we? We don't even have an army. So his argument was, look, it's going to happen. You talk to anybody who knows what's going on, sooner or later, we will separate from Great Britain. And that our true strength is in our unity. And he believes that it would be very easy to build up a navy to take on the British Navy because look at all the resources that we have. We have vast forests and other resources. Uh, our, our iron mines could produce enough to make cannons and weapons. We could uh, defend ourselves quite easily uh, with the resources that we have. And finally, of course, uh, other nations will help when they see Britain in distress. And if we declare independence, they will join our side. I mean, who doesn't like to kick Great Britain around back in those days because they are the big bully on the block? So that was basically the arguments that he had in common sense. So during the Revolutionary War, and by the way, um, I, I should throw into the effect that it had in the colonies um, was shocking to virtually everybody. And the, uh, at the Continental Congress, they knew that this was the great mover of the people. For those who had wanted independence from the beginning, um, they were very frustrated. John Adams and others, Samuel Adams, uh, they were very frustrated that so many people just were not going to uh, sign up for this independence. But it was common sense that turned the tide. And so more and more people were turning towards the idea that, yeah, we should become independent. And so after uh, July 2nd, remember that date, July 2nd, when we voted on independence, um, Thomas Paine was in uh, with all his heart, he was going to help this cause. Uh, he was an aide de camp under Nathaniel Green, who, by the way, uh, was a Quaker himself, raised as a Quaker. Um, and uh, he was at, unfortunately, he was at Fort Lee that was overrun by the British Army uh, once they kicked George Washington out of New York. So he retreated with Washington uh, to the Delaware and in December of 1776, it looked like uh, the game was up, and George Washington said this himself. The enlistments were up. People are deserting. My army is dwindling. If I don't get more recruits, the game is pretty well up. We're done. And so, as we all know, he had something, he, a kind of rabbit to pull out of his hat. But part of this, too, in December 1776, Thomas Paine wrote another, only this was a series of articles that we now collect together as the crisis, or sometimes it's the American crisis. 
There were 13 articles altogether written throughout the war at different points. And of course, they're inspirational uh, articles to keep up morale of the soldiers and the people. Uh, the first article was read to Washington's troops December 23, just a couple of days before crossing the Delaware. And for me, some of the best lines that he ever wrote, the most poetic, are from the first, art, first uh, crisis paper. These are the times that try men's souls. These first opening lines were absolutely fantastic. And Washington had them read to uh, the soldiers the day before that uh, uh, crossing of the Delaware. And that was the watchword. That was the uh, password, as we would call it now, uh, among the soldiers. The password is, these are the times that try men's souls. And so that inspired them to cross the Delaware, attack the Hessians at Trenton, and um, have a, a huge morale boost, not just for the soldiers, but for the people as a whole. So after this, he became uh, uh, part of the Committee for Foreign Affairs, uh, 1777 to 1779. Um, and he lost that job, as he often loses jobs, uh, for being outspoken. Uh, he wrote an article exposing some fraud in a, a loan deal between France and America. Um, the problem was uh, France, he, he was told, France is not doing that for us. You're not supposed to say that. It was a big embarrassment because this loan was not supposed to happen or at least France was not acknowledging that it was happening. But uh, it, there was some fraud uh, involved in this, and somebody, uh, I believe it was Silas Dean, was making some money on this deal, and um, so he exposed them in the papers for that. Um, and so the French minister, being quite embarrassed by this exposure, uh, asked Congress to dismiss uh, Thomas Paine from that position. So near the end of the war, he became a clerk to the Pennsylvania Assembly. Uh, he traveled to Paris to, with Henry Lawrence to obtain a different loan. This one was more out in the open, and they came back with uh, a good amount of money uh, to help the uh, flagging efforts in America. And then the final uh, crisis paper at the end of the war, the times that try men's souls is over. And so he could announce that we have won the war, that we now have our independence that we have always needed and wanted. So I mentioned earlier that Thomas Paine had another skill in engineering. Where he learned it, we're not really sure. But um, after the war, um, he was dirt poor, never made any money, by the way, off of common sense or any of the crisis papers. Uh, he wanted that to be given to the war effort, the income from that. So he was given a pension and he was given a house in uh, New York, a confiscated house from a uh, British Tory who escaped back to Great Britain. And um, so, uh, in his semi-retirement, he decided he was going to work on a bridge, a new design using iron or a steel bridge that could span a river uh, completely without with having a, a much larger span than anything that anybody had ever conceived before. And it was going to go across the Schuylkill River. It river is what? Schuylkill. Schuylkill. Thank you. Thank you. Schuylkill. That, that looks just crazy to me. Um, so, what's that? Schuylkill. Schuylkill. Okay. That's the way they say it in Philadelphia. Okay. Schuylkill. That's where the river is. Yeah. All right, so the idea was that he was gonna build a bridge that could span the whole river uh, using steel, and, um, but he couldn't get the funds for it, not, 
very many people were interested in supporting that idea. It's a new idea and kind of scary. So he went to France to uh, see if he could get some more uh, funds and interest in that. And he actually went between France and England several times uh, promoting this idea. And so here is, eventually they did build a bridge. I don't want to get into this too much, but uh, later on in England, uh, they did create Tom Paine's bridge. He actually, he took out a patent on his idea, the engineering of it, and uh, he got a patent. And uh, once he fell out of favor, others took up the, uh, the idea and eventually did build uh, the bridge that he had envisioned using steel. But something else came up that interrupted his plans. That was the French Revolution. Tom Paine was supportive, heartily supportive of the French Revolution. He thought this was wonderful. Not only are we going to have a revolution in America, we're going to have one in France as well. And this one's going to be just as successful as the one in America. He spoke out in favor of it, which made him very unpopular in England. And he had to escape. Uh, otherwise, he would be, have been imprisoned and possibly executed for treason. Because uh, with, with the uh, violence uh, that was occurring in France uh, and the uh, the directory that was breathing fire and brimstone against all the other nations of the world that have kings. Um, he spoke up in favor of it, and that was treason in England. He fled to France, and he was welcomed as a hero. He was well known. Common sense was well read in Europe, uh, and especially in France. And so he was welcomed as a hero, and he got the key to the Bastille to give to George Washington from uh, Lafayette. Uh, he almost immediately became a member of the French Assembly, uh, though he did not speak French at all. Um, but he was a man of his convictions. You got to give it to him that he had courage. He spoke out against the execution of the king and queen. And it was almost comical in the assembly in this, as this debate was going on, he would say to his interpreter his arguments in favor of saving the king and queen. He wanted either they should be exiled to America or they should, be, they should get life in prison. And so when he was giving these arguments to his interpreter and the interpreter would say this to the assembly, they were outraged. And so somebody else comes up and says, no, that, that translation was all wrong. Thomas Paine would never say such a thing. <laughs> and so, um, but he, he took his life in his hands. When you're in the French Revolution and you're arguing for anything, um, you are in dangerous territory. So here is the key to the Bastille that uh, I believe is at uh, Mount Vernon now. How many of you have been to Mount Vernon? Have you, did you see this? No. You notice it now? Supposedly they're hanging on the wall somewhere. And of course, the famous painting of the French Revolution. I had to throw that one in. A uh, question? Yes. Um, the English knew what he had, role he had played in the American Revolution, yet he, he lived in England afterward. Yeah, you know, how, how does that make sense? The thing about America, we were not, in, in breaking away from Great Britain, we were not, uh, aside from Thomas Paine, uh, we were not uh, hateful towards the British as much as we just want separation. That was the main argument. Yeah. Um, we wanted separation. And there were many people in America after the war was done who really wanted reconciliation along you know, separate lines so that we have our country, they have their country, and we will fully respect them as they, they, their type of government with a monarchy. Um, there's, a, there's a very interesting scene of uh, John Adams who became minister to uh, England 
at this time, at when we first got our independence, where he meets King George. And uh, if you saw that, uh, that miniseries on John Adams, it's a really interesting scene where he comes up and he bows like three or four times before he can actually get up to him. Um, but they have very respectful words exchanged. Uh, so we did not want to be enemies with Great Britain, and we made that known uh, very clearly afterwards. Uh, the French Revolution was different. Uh, they, they were enemies to all tyrants, and, and that was very clear. So that's, I think, uh, when Thomas Paine spoke up in favor of the French Revolution, and the French Revolution is breathing fire and brimstone at uh, the British monarchy, uh, that was not a smart thing. So he had to escape. So, the French Revolution. Uh, Edmund Burke, very prominent uh, member of parliament uh, in Great Britain, uh, wrote his Reflections on the Revolution in France, condemning the violence and the very uh, notion of the philosophy behind the French Revolution, believing that they could start uh, the world anew and have a perfect government and, and perfect uh, society. Uh, so Thomas Paine wrote, in response, the rights of man, defending the French Revolution. Um, and of course, when you're, like I said before, if you are involved at all in the French Revolution, and if you know anything about the, what happened during the French Revolution, uh, you were taking your life in your hands no matter what position you took because in the next year or two uh, they're going to change hands and the people who were st who were the Girondists who uh, Thomas Paine associated with they lost power uh, the next group that came in uh, started executing them uh, Thomas Paine was thrown in prison uh, because of his association with the Girondists um, ten months in prison and uh, finally released. Uh, they say that he should have been executed, uh, but the person who is, uh, the guy who would go through and mark on the doors of the, the people who were to be executed the next day, um, probably not a very intelligent person, the door was open. And so he wrote whatever mark he was to mark on the open door and then when the door was shut, the person who came by to choose the ones who were to be executed didn't see it because it was on the inside, not on the outside. <laughs> so anyway, um, he was saved, he got out of prison. He stayed in France for a number of years afterwards, uh, but here is uh, the rights of man, an answer to uh, Burke's attack on the French Revolution. There's Edmund Burke. So in the rights of man, uh, he argued that the violence uh, was necessary. It's not always a pretty thing, but uh, it was necessary. He argued that our rights are inherent and not given by the government, uh, that authority was derived from the people common arguments in America, but uh, somewhat different in Europe. He also, at this time, a little bit later, um, was really going out on a limb uh, with the age of reason. In France, it was somewhat safe to do this. Uh, Thomas Paine has often been called an atheist, and he was not. He was a deist. And he actually had a fervent belief in God, but his God was the original mover, created the universe, and then just stepped back and watched it run. Uh, he also believed, which kind of surprises me, that a lot of deists at this time um, also believed in heaven, or at least some sort of afterlife. This was the same as Ben Franklin, who had the same general beliefs. He believed that... Uh, God created the universe and left people to act uh, the way they were going to act, uh, did not interfere in day-to-day -day life, 
But there was an afterlife. If you were a good person, you would go to heaven. If you were a bad person, you'd go to hell. Um, Thomas Paine believed in an afterlife. He didn't speak much of it, uh, but he did believe in it. But he was against established religion. Uh, he called, he spent a lot of time talking about how awful the Bible was. It was a creation of man, a book of lies and wickedness and blasphemy. He actually had some reverence for the God that he believed in, and he thought the Bible took away from that. Um, and he ridicules the stories of the Bible um, and talks about the history of Christianity being filled with corruption and oppression. Um, so, and like I said, he did believe in a creator, but it was an impersonal creator who was who maybe watches what's going on but does not interfere and there's the age of reason and I like uh, the title is kind of interesting true and fabulous theology <laughs> fabulous meaning something quite different from what we use it today Now, today, people who are really into uh, the, the whole idea of the left and the right will know that Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine um, are often considered the, uh, the parents of the left and the right. The modern left and right, uh, by some people's reckoning, began with these two men. And so, this is a book, I don't have this book, I didn't read this book, but I came across it on YouTube. This was a uh, lecture by this man, uh, Yuval Levine, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of the Left and Right. And it was an interesting lecture, about an hour or so, and um, so he describes the basic philosophies of these two men and how they are uh, now considered by many to be uh, the progenitors of these movements. Uh, Paine uses the state of nature analogy and how new ideas are a break from the old. This was, his term was, we have the ability to start the world anew. So this is a complete break from what has happened in the past. Burke sees things differently. He sees rights as an inheritance from the past and how uh, we have to proceed not completely anew, but we proceed from where we are. And uh, how the American Revolution succeeded because it was not a break, a complete break from the past. It succeeded because we used what we had and built upon it. Whereas the French Revolution, um, it was a disaster in many ways because they thought they could just rid themselves from all the bad stuff, all the feudal laws, and start completely fresh. And that just didn't work out too well. So here is um, his style, as I've said before. It's a style that is accessible to ordinary people. It is not um, nearly as complex as Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and many of the others. And if you've read anything of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, and many of these other patriots, um, and then read Common Sense, you'll see that Common Sense is a much easier read. Um, he's the one who came up with the following phrases. These are the times that try men's souls, everybody knows that. He came up with the age of reason. Many historians will tell you he's the first one to use the phrase the United States. Um, and my own opinion, as I've said, he, for me, he's kind of disorganized, especially common sense. is a bit disorganized, uh, but he wrote at a level that most common people could understand, uh, which was entirely different. The arguments that were being made by Adams and many of the other writers in 1776 went completely over the heads of ordinary people. It was only for the well-educated to read these things and be convinced by them. When Thomas Paine wrote 
that's when ordinary people could understand it. And the same thing with his other writings. Um, the Age of Reason or The Rights of Man uh, became huge bestsellers. Uh, it also made him a, a very unwanted person uh, amongst many people, especially the age of reason, because that's when, uh, if you're ridiculing the Bible, um, you're not going to be too popular in America, uh, especially back in those days. But he did come back to America, oddly enough, He spent a number of years in France. He actually met Napoleon and didn't like him. <laughs> and for good reason, as we know. But um, he was so intent on promoting his ideas of government and getting rid of monarchies and feudal systems that he actually wanted Napoleon to invade Great Britain and overthrow, overthrow the monarchy there. So he was eventually released from prison, came uh, back to America in 1802. Uh, not very well liked. Uh, he had a few friends, but not many. And he was pretty much an outcast until his death, uh, June 8, 1809. And then um, to add insult to injury, uh, there's a man who came, uh, William Cobbett. In 1819, uh, a big fan of Thomas Paine, he came and asked if he could take his bones back to England. He was buried there at, near his house. Uh, another interesting part of this, in his will, he asked if he could be buried in a Quaker uh, cemetery. He had fond memories of the Quakers. He liked them. Uh, of course, that wasn't going to work out. The Quakers didn't like him too much. Uh, <laughs> So he was buried uh, outside of his house, and one of his big fans from England came uh, 10 years later and said, asked if I could take uh, Tom Paine's bones back to England and we'll have uh, a great uh, burial site for him. And nobody cared. Take him, we don't want him. Uh, so he took, dug up Thomas Paine's bones, took him to England, and uh, he found that nobody in England wanted him either. <laughs> he wanted a great monument for this highly influential person, and um, nobody would do it. So he kept Tom Paine's bones in a box in his house, and then he died. And the person who inherited the, uh, this man's estate, um, we have no idea what he did with the bones. So now there are legends that uh, someone has uh, a leg bone or a skull or some other bone of Thomas Paine. Uh, my guess is that they, they probably just didn't care and buried him out back someplace. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the, uh, the end of Thomas Paine. And here is his house in New Rochelle the house that was confiscated from a British Tory and uh, given to Tom Paine. What state is that in? Uh, New York. Oh, no. Just uh, north of New York City, I believe, New Rochelle. Anybody visit there? Nobody's seen it? Have you seen it? Good, good. Yes. All right. There's somebody in Oak Ridge who was brought up in New Rochelle. Okay, yeah. I so, went to school not too far from there. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, so I am done early. <laughs> so, any questions? There was an article many years ago in Sports Illustrated on the subject of judges at field events. Did you happen to see that article? No. His title was, These Are the Souls That Try Men's Time. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yes? Just for your information, a stay in a course of a few different things. The stay is actually the bone or baleen peg rod things that are sewn into the course. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so being a stay maker. Probably would not. I would guess that those were made by dressmakers. 
original stage. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but his his position was his job was a stay maker. But if the stay is just the bone, the stay is just the bone part. Yeah. Maybe that was just a term that they used back in those days for a corset maker who that used I that. I, I can't imagine that a woman. But that's what he, that's what, yeah. But like I said, there was only one uh, historian who said he thought it may have been uh, a term of derision uh, that his enemies used on him later on. Um, but everybody else seems to assume that he was called a stay maker, that's what a stay is, and so that's what his job was to make uh, women's corsets using stays. Yes? A straight question this time. Well, the times that you mentioned, the are they located on the coast? No. I'm not sure. Okay. It's in Sussex County. Um, I was if it's on the coast, if it's not on the coast, I would argue against it being something that shows. Right, yeah, yeah. Good Lose point. Lose is? Okay. So it's possible, and I suppose. He went into being a privateer, so I mean, he was around the ocean. Yeah, yeah. So. Yes? When you said in his plan of government, three fifths. Were necessary to pass legislation? Yes. Was that each individual voting on himself? That's as as a whole. You know, the whole Congress together, if they're passing legislation. Okay, so it's not by states or colonies, it's each individual. I, I, you know, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. So, yes. So is this house historical yes there is there's a plaque there is a plaque out front so now they yes even though they didn't like him back then now they've kind of he's, he's uh, been recuperated somewhat <laughs> so, yeah do you think his writing was simple enough that the current president could understand it? <laughs> i'm going to pass on that that's a good one so how many of how many of you know of the journalist who passed away a couple of years ago, Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. yeah, he wrote a book on Thomas Paine and the rights of man, because he was really into Tom Paine himself, Can, uh, thought of him very highly as a, uh, uh, like I said, kind of the forerunner of uh, the liberal movement today, um, Thomas Paine. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. So next week, George the Third, get him to the king. I'm mostly English, so it's my people I'm talking about. Uh -huh. I screw it up. Every